you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. What you are about to hear is real. The prophets wrote of a time when the signs of the end would be seen. This is where Bible prophecy and current events collide. This is Unsealed. Yes, my friends, welcome. This is the Unsealed Podcast. I'm Pastor Christopher Manti, your humble host. Yes, I hope I'm humble. Um, I welcome you in the name of Jesus the Messiah. I trust that um, you trust him with your soul and your very life and your very breath, because that is the truth. And so uh, I welcome you, and we are actually simulcasting live uh, throughout the universe. Uh, through Facebook and YouTube right now. So if you're there, to say hello. Please let me know you're out there um, in any of those formats. If you're listening live uh, on the podcast through Spreaker, you can actually interact that way as well. Just say hello. Let me know who you are, where you are, question, comment, uh, encouragement. Those are always good. And so we want to um, always build up the church, right? That's why... I'm doing what I'm doing here. So this is, again, the Unsealed Podcast. Please go to unsealedpodcast.com to see all previous episodes, or hear all previous episodes. Uh, You'll find links for free resources there, including uh, an app called the End Time Church app, which is revolutionary. It's for Christians by Christians. It's no more godless social media or giant corporations. It's just us. So go get that and use it, please. It's very, very cool and useful. Um, You'll see links for resources like uh, online courses and mission and a church called the End Time Church, which you are welcome to participate in every Monday night live at 8 p.m., but then all week on the app. Uh, And this, which is Flee to the Mountains, the book that yours truly wrote. And uh, in my humble opinion, it's pretty important um, that you read it. So go get it, fleettothemountainsbook.com or fleettothemountainscourse.com. If you're interested in both, I'll send you a free book, by the way, um, if you go to uh, wingsoftheeagle.com slash free book, and then you'll get the course and the book for the same price. Uh, Free book time, right? Good. All right, praise the Lord. Uh, So please go check out the website, share it, uh, show that you care by sharing. That's the one thing we ask here. Um, and of course, you can um, help us to continue to bring this program to you, whether it be live streaming or radio podcasting, etc., uh, by donating. Please give generously. You're 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 the source, you guys. I mean, God is the source; God provides, but He does it through the church. So that's you. Without your uh, generosity, generosity, this doesn't happen. This goes away. Um, I just tell you the truth. So support it if it helps you. If you learned anything today. Give something. That's all I ask. All right. Um, Yes, we can see your messages. Rodney, hello. Uh, And somebody from California, M. E. G. Anyway, guys, uh, hey, um, I don't... I want to get to the message, okay? And then we'll do questions and comments later. If you wouldn't mind. So that is tremendous. Again, we've gone through a whole bunch of episodes now. This is episode... uh, eight of this season two that just started in april so actually total we've got 42 episodes of unsealed so that's a bunch go ahead and listen and uh cover a whole bunch of prophetic things and current events things uh and this one continuously comes up and um i just wanted to hopefully straighten it out for everybody which is battle of gog and magog Gog of Magog in Ezekiel thirty-eight, thirty-nine cannot be before Armageddon. 
because this is very popular theory. Um, and it's not sound. It's not biblically sound to hold that position. Um, and it's important that we don't hold positions that aren't biblical. Amen. <laughs> Duh, right? I mean, that's as believers, as Christians, we think the Bible is the Word of God. Can't be adding or subtracting from the Word of God. We've got to get it right. Um, with the Holy Spirit's help, of course. He's our teacher. Uh, but then he also sends out teachers who can help. And um, hopefully that'll be today for you. So uh, I'm just going to basically read through Ezekiel 38, 39 and uh, show you how it cannot be. Any of it cannot be before the last seven years, and none of it, the, the defeat of Gog, cannot be before Armageddon itself. And we know the Battle of Armageddon is fought by Jesus uh, as he returns. Um, so let's go through it. Let's let the text speak for itself, all right? No, no reason to argue or say people are wrong, just quote the text. So let's take a look. I'm going to share a screen if we're watching. If you're uh, on podcast, it's okay. I'll read it. Um, actually, I did want to get the my Bible with all the notes in it, but I forgot it. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Um, yeah, it would be inappropriate to grab it now. Anyway, let's just check it out. This is from the New Living Translation. You can use translation of your choice. doesn't matter. Although, it does kind of come up here a little bit. Uh, depending on your version, your translation that you use, you will see a slightly different um, expression. This is the word of the Lord, the message that came to me from the Lord, Son of Man. Turn and face Gog of the land of Magog. The prince who rules over the nations of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. This is right off the bat. This is the verse where you're going to see different translations say Rosh, R O S H, it capitalized as if that was another land. That is incorrect. Rosh, just, you don't like Rosh Hashanah? You ever hear that holiday? Jewish holiday? Hebrew holiday, right? First of the year. Rosh means first, or chief, or head, or commander. First in line, etc. Okay? It's not a country. Never was. Never will be. It's not a place. It's his um, title. This Gog. This man called Gog. He is the leader. The prince of Meshach and Tubal, these nations are in Turkey. The land of Magog is Turkey. And that's important to know, that he is of the land of Magog. In other words, even the, the phrase, Battle of Gog and Magog, is a misnomer, inasmuch as you want to put it before the millennium, before the return of Jesus. It's literally impossible. There is one verse in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, um, that talks about after the millennium, Satan is loosed on the earth one last time after he's in prison for a thousand years for the millennium. He's let out, and then he gathers all the rebels, everyone who wants to overthrow Jesus, King Jesus, on the earth. Uh, he gathers them all up, and there is a phrase that says, like Gog and Magog, or the battle of Gog and Magog. That's post-millennial. That's not this. So there's Gog. When, when someone says the battle of Gog and Magog, they're not referring to the post-millennial after Satan is released from his prison battle. They're just not, right? We all know that. Because there's almost no detail about that in the whole scripture. The Ezekiel 38, 39 is totally different. And we'll see. All right, so first of all, we've got the prince who rules over the nations of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. Give him this message from the Sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. Well, if, if you're against God or against Christ, you'd be anti-Christ. The Antichrist. 
because it's an individual. Gog's an individual. Gog is not a land either, by the way. I've seen, um, I've seen folks try to teach that. <laughs> that Gog is a place. Well, he's, there's no way in the text you can come to that. Um, so it's an individual. Gog, I am your enemy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with your whole army. Your horses and your charioteers in full armor and a great horde armed with shields and swords. So God says, even though you think you're doing, you're in control of your armies, actually I am. I'm going to do this to you. And who's with him? Not just the nations that are Turkey and northern Syria and Iraq, which is where he's from. That's the modern countries, right? But Persia. What's Persia? Iran. Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia is now called Sudan. There's, there is still an Ethiopia in the, the modern map, but that's farther south than what the Bible's talking about because in the Old Testament, um, Ethiopia borders Egypt, and Egypt never went as far south as modern Ethiopia. Anyway, that's, so think of Sudan, okay? The Sudan. Um, so we've got Iran, Sudan, and Libya, and Libya is still Libya northern coast of um, the other border of Egypt, okay? The north, northern coast of Africa on the Mediterranean. So you have uh, the two neighbors of Egypt, as well as Iran, uh, partnering, their armies partnering with the Antichrist from Turkey, and Iraq, and Syria. And we have, this is not the first time we hear this story, right? I mean, we know Daniel the prophet, we know Revelation 13, we know uh, other places. This is not, should be nothing new to us. Um, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will also join you, along with the armies of Beth Togarma from the distant north and many others. Gomer and Beth Togarma, again, uh, are in what we call Turkey today. The, the country Turkey today is an amalgamation of different peoples. Anatolia used to be called, okay? Asia Minor, New Testament calls it, or Asia. Um,. Maybe you're, you're including some of the neighboring, current neighboring countries like Azerbaijan, like Armenia. Um, that's about as far north as you go. So I know the temptation or the false teaching on this is to bring Russia into this verse. It's not there. Um, get ready. So when it says distant north, again, don't get, don't mix it up. Don't put anything unbiblical in here or beyond the scope of the Bible. It's not there. Russia is not there. Russia is not part of this. Never was. If you're in Israel, the distant north is the Black Sea. That's the northern coast of Turkey. That's as far as the Bible sees, okay? For the prophets of the Bible. Obviously, God sees everything. But there is no more far north than that. In the biblical lens. Get ready. Be prepared. Keep all the... Uh, what did I just say? And many others. Okay, so there are other nations that are not listed. Get ready. Be prepared. Keep all the armies around you. By the way, those, ar those armies not listed are all Middle Eastern. Because again, that's the scope of the scriptures. We can't throw in Russia, China, America in there, or Europe. <clears throat> Verse 7. Get ready. Be prepared. Keep all the armies around you mobilized. And take command of them for a long time now. You will be called into action. From now, you will be called into action. In the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel. So even though Ezekiel is seeing this, and he's, he's God is telling Ezekiel, tell this to Gog, yet the man Gog is not alive yet, and he won't be on the scene for a long, long time. The distant future, a long time from now, the time of the end. Uh, in the distant future, you will swoop down on the land of Israel, which will be enjoying peace after recovering from war and after its people have returned from many lands to the mountains of Israel. Now, listen to that. This is some old versions will say the land of unwalled villages, right? 
because it's at peace. Why would Israel be at peace before Gog attacks? Now listen, this is for folks who think that Gog and Magog, you know, Gog can attack Israel today. The, are they in a land of unwalled villages? Do they are they experiencing some kind of peace? Did Hamas just not rain a thousand rockets on them? There's no peace there. So there has to be, before Gog ever invades Israel, there is a time of peace where they feel secure. The only time ever that will occur is after they agree to a peace deal. A major one. The major one. One with implications for every nation around them. Every nation surrounding Israel will agree not to attack. There will be no more terrorism in Israel for three and a half years. That's how secure they will be. That's called the covenant with death and the grave. Death in Sheol that Isaiah talks about, Revelation talks about, Daniel 9 talks about. Only at that point will they feel secure and have um, safety and peace. And of course it's a false peace because the Antichrist breaks it, otherwise known as Gog. And we're going to see in a second the proof of that statement yet again. Um, ro- uh, you and your all your allies, so these ones, the armies that you've convinced to come with you, a vast and awesome army will roll down on them, Israel, like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. And we know, Luke 21, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know the desolation thereof is near. This is exactly what it's saying. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, that at that time, evil thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise a wicked scheme. This is, again, Daniel 11 echoes the same exact phrases. You will say Israel is an unprotected land filled with unwalled villages. There's the unwalled villages. This means a city without defenses. Think, there's no city in Israel that doesn't have the Iron Dome over it today, right? I mean, just... Think about it. If you think the this invasion of Gog is anywhere close to being true, it's not. Um, Unwalled villages, I will march against her and destroy these people who live in such confidence. He's talking about Israel now. He's going to destroy them for living in such confidence because they think they can make uh, and have peace um, with their Gentile nations who hate them instead of God, instead of Jesus. That's the point. That's the point of Jacob's trouble, that he will allow this to come upon them and for a second holocaust, frankly, to occur because they will not turn to him. They'll turn to themselves and their own strength and their own military and their own uh, ability to make uh, peace agreements with their neighbors that he specifically said, don't do that. Back in the Torah, right? Uh, I will go to these formerly, verse 12, I will go to these formerly desolate cities that are now filled with people. So this is Israel has gone through a lot. Now they've rebuilt and they have no, um, they're at total peace and prosperity. Now filled with people who have returned from exile in many nations. This is called the Alia. Alia. Uh, my friend Chad Harvey, who we interviewed a couple weeks ago here on this program, um, has written about this extensively. He calls it the um, f- the fishermen and the hunters, that the, the Jews will be um, brought back to Israel from every land through two different means. The fishermen, which are the friendly folks to them, whether it be Christians, you know, uh, allowing for them to return, or the government of Israel itself to make the return possible. Or the hunters, which are basically the Muslim enemies, the terrorists. And by the way, not just Muslims, the anti-Semitism that you're seeing rising in the church today uh, is going to cause this as well. Where There are Jews being chased in the streets now in America. So this, those are hunters. Okay, anyways. Um, so they will be uh, returning from every nation all over the earth and... By the way, it's not just because they're afraid sometimes, but if you have a condition where the final seven years have begun, that's what we understand, but they see peace. Finally, we have peace. We have unwalled villages. The Iron Dome is not needed. 
I can, I can move there and be really at peace in my land with my people. That is what that, that covenant of death in the grave, that first three and a half year period, is going to be a great boon. I mean, it's, the population of Israel will explode in numbers, okay? Jews will come from everywhere now. They'll say, this is our home. We're going to fill it. And they will. Um, uh, where are we? Verse 12. I'll capture vast amounts of plunder. For the people are rich with livestock and other possessions now. They think the whole world revolves around them. But Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish will ask, Do you really think the armies you have gathered can rob them of silver and gold? Do you think you can drive away their livestock and seize their goods and carry off plunder? That's talking to Gog. Now, some would say this is actually an opponent of Gog's. They're having second thoughts. Sheba and Dedan are in Saudi Arabia. Uh, And the merchants of Tarshish, we really don't know for sure what that is, other than it's the Mediterranean Sea coast lands. Some say it's Spain. Um, Some say it's Cyprus, whatever, somewhere in the Mediterranean. More Western um, allies, okay? Um, Verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog, Gog the man. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord, when my people are living in peace in their land, meaning the last three and a half years. There can be no other time, guys. Then you will rouse yourself. The Antichrist is not going to be invading anything. Gog will not be invading anything until the seven-year peace deal is started. The thought won't even enter his mind. Or he won't do anything about it until they're at peace. Um, You will rouse yourself. You will come from your homeland in the distant north with your vast cavalry and mighty army, and you will attack my people Israel, covering their land like a cloud. This is the invasion of Israel. This is the what creates the abomination of desolation. This is the great sign, and this word says, when you see this, flee to the mountains, Israel. Where you will have help in those mountains, Revelation 12, from the Gentiles who know better. Where will you be, my friend? Uh, at that time, the distant future, in the distant future, end times, I will bring you against my land as everyone watches, and my holiness will be displayed by what happens to you, Gog. Then all the nations will know that I am Yehovah, I am the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord asks. Aren't you the one? Or it says, are you the one? Different translations, I think, uh, ask it or translate this a little better. Um, Are you the one? I was talking about long ago when I announced through Israel's prophet. So now it says this is the time of the end. Now he's looking back. He's actually talking to the future Gog, the Gog. When he shows up in these last seven years, he's saying, remember... Aren't you the one who I talked about long ago through Israel's prophets? Like Ezekiel. And like other ones. Like Isaiah, when he calls the Assyrian the one who invades the land. When Micah calls him the Assyrian. When Daniel calls him the king of the north. Etc. Those prophets... Aren't you the one who I announced through Israel's prophets in the future that I would bring you against my people? In other words, he's saying, yes, you are the one who I already mentioned and called different names, but the same message, the same prophecy through many prophets of Israel. Not new prophets, okay? Old Testament. Didn't I tell you in the Old Testament, Israel, that this was coming? So this is saying that Gog is the Antichrist, period. I'm sorry, I had to block someone who's pushing uh, British Israelism, which is a terrible lie. Um... 
Um, anyway, sorry to get distracted. So the Antichrist is Gog. Gog is the Antichrist. It's just another name for him. Period. The end. That means he can't come tomorrow. He's not going to be invading Israel. It's not Erdogan. For example, even though he checks a lot of the boxes. Um, so if you say, well, is Gog, does Gog, is Gog the Antichrist? I wonder. Uh, Ezekiel thirty-eight seventeen tells you that, yes, he is. But this is what the Sovereign Lord says, verse 18. When Gog invades the land of Israel, and he will, my fury will boil over. So he'll allow it for a time. He'll allow the invasion, but then God will end up fighting him. In my jealousy and blazing anger, I promise a mighty shaking in the land of Israel on that day. All living things, the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals of the field, the small animals that scurry along the ground, all the people on earth will quake in terror at my presence. That sounds a lot like the trumpets. That sounds, in the Revelation, that sounds a lot like the seals. That sounds a lot like the sixth seal. When Jesus is revealed from heaven and all the nations shake and are terrified and try to hide themselves in the rocks. Does it not? Mountains will be thrown down. Cliffs will crumble. Walls will fall to the earth. I will summon the sword against you on all the hills of Israel, says the Sovereign Lord. So that means they're in Israel. The invasion was successful. And we know from Zechariah the prophet that two-thirds will be cut off. Two-thirds of the Jews will die. And the rest will be taken away unless they flew, flew, they fleed, okay? They went to the mountains like they were instructed by the Christians. And if we don't tell them, no one will. Think about that. Pray about it. Um, I will summon the sword against you on all the hills of Israel. Your men will turn their swords against each other. I will punish, and that's an old mm, tried and true method by God. You look back through, you know, way back in the Old Testament book of Judges and, and Kings and whatever, um, this happened pretty often. And God will confuse an enemy army and have them kill each other. Uh, I will punish you and your armies with disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstones, fire, burning sulfur. Again, this sounds like the vials of God's wrath. Because it is. Uh, In this way I will show my greatness and holiness, and I will make myself known to all the nations of the world. Then they will know that I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. Let's continue. Son of man, prophesy against Gog. Give him this message from the Sovereign Lord. I am your enemy, O Gog, ruler of the nations of Meshach and Tubal. Again, an individual person. For, for those who would say Gog is a nation, how can a nation rule other, be the ruler of nation? It's silly. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit the text. Ezekiel 38-39 is very plain and literal. Extremely literal. I am your enemy, O Gog, ruler of the nations of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around and drive you toward the mountains of Israel, bringing you from the distant north. We already established where he comes from. I will knock the bow from your left hand and the arrows from your right, and I will leave you helpless. You and your army and your and your allies, so the other nations too, like Iran, like Sudan, Libya, will die on these mountains mountains of Israel, because they'll all be there. I will feed you to the vultures and wild animals. You will fall on the open rocks, uh, the open fields, for I have spoken, says the Sovereign Lord, and I will rain down fire on Magog, your homeland, and on all your allies who live safely on the coasts. Then they will know that I am the Lord. The coast of what? The coast of the Mediterranean. How about uh, the the beast that comes out of the sea and onto the seashore? Revelation thirteen one. Th- th- this is where they are. They set up camp all around. 
They're all around Israel, on the, like Egypt, like Libya, like Sudan. They all have shorelines. Saudi, Syria, Lebanon, again, Turkey, right? Cyprus, even. These are all places where they feel safe because they, they're all in league with each other, and they're all um, finally getting rid of the Jews. That's what they think. And the Christians, if they can get them. Um... Anyone who defends Israel will be treated as a kafir. I'll feed you to the vultures and wild animals. You'll fall in the open fields where I have spoken. I'll rain down fire. Sorry, I said that already. Um, safely on the coast, then they will know that I am the Lord. Doesn't this sound familiar? About having feeding the birds with the flesh and hailstones? It should. It's, it's Revelation 19. Which, of course, is the return of Jesus and him fighting the Battle of Armageddon. This way I will make known my holy name among the people of Israel. That's the point. Israel will see him fight. We'll see Jesus himself fight. The King Messiah will return. That's when they will repent. They will see him pierced. And mourn for him like an only son. All the tribes will mourn. This is what that is. It's for Israel's sake. I will not let anyone bring shame on it, Israel. And the nations too. So not just Israel, the nation, but all the nations too. The ones who can, the Gentiles, the Gentiles, will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. That day of judgment will come, says the Sovereign Lord. Everything will happen just as I declared it. The day of judgment I'm, I don't know how much clearer God can be. Um, I just don't know how much clearer he can be. Day of judgment is the day of judgment. The second coming, the day of the Lord. This is not seven years. A lot of people... Folks think this Ezekiel 38, 39 can be fulfilled before the final seven years, before the rapture, or whatever. No, it can't. It's not possible. It's got to be the very end. There has to be three and a half years of peace. Then the thought of invading enters the mind of Gog the Antichrist, that he actually invades. Then Gog uh, destroys them in the land of Israel, which means they've succeeded. That's a point, too. A lot of folks believe that God will never allow Israel to be defeated. Wrong. Wrong. Never be invaded. Never again. <clears throat> Wrong answer. That's not what the scripture says. God has spoken on these things. He just said it. Everything will happen just as I said. Just as I said. With the armies of the enemy in Israel, in the mountains of Israel, in Jerusalem, they succeeded. Because God let them. Don't, right, don't make a mistake about that. It's not like it's against God's will that the invasion happens. It's directly because of what he wants. And he allows it for a reason. It's called Jacob's Trouble. And he will be delivered out of it. That's Jeremiah, right? This is the deliverance at the very end when it seems all hope is lost. And all hope is lost other than Jesus. Yeshua is the only hope of Israel. In a, in a spiritual sense and the physical sense. Uh, verse 9, Ezekiel 39, 9. Then the people in the towns of Israel will go... Israel will go out and pick up your small and large shields, bows and arrows, javelins and spears, and they will use them for fuel. Yeah, there's still a nation there. There's still a remnant who survives, thanks to, thanks to those who listened and, and left, and then now will come back. And then there's going to have to be, after the defeat, there's going to be a lot of weapons and bodies lying around. And this is what this next verses are going to tell us. They'll use them for fuel. There will be enough to last them seven years. Now, personally, I think uh, this is the positive side of what we just witnessed, which is the seven years 
uh, of Daniel's 70th week being seven years long. Half was peaceful, half was Holocaust. Um, but now we're going to actually remember this period for seven more years into the millennium. The first seven years of Jesus on the earth will be in the land of Israel. Will be A lot of it will be involving burning weapons and bodies, or burying bodies. Uh, there will be enough to last them seven years. They won't need to cut wood from the fields or, or forests, for these weapons will give them all the fuel they need. Now, that's cool because, yes, it could definitely be wooden weapons, like, uh, you know, in days, days gone by, or metal. You can melt metal and, you know, turn that into all kinds of energy. Or it could be nuclear. That gives you energy if you use it the right way. Anyway, uh, they will plunder those who plan to plunder to th- plan to plunder them, and they will rob those who plan to rob them, says the sovereign Lord. And I will make a vast graveyard for Gog and his hordes, his hordes, individual man, in the valley of the travelers. Um, I like this translation here because it's so difficult. <laughs> um, Bibles will be all over the place in this verse. Um, Hebrew just says the sea. When it says east of the sea, this version puts in the Dead Sea. That may well be correct. Um, Because what do we have east of the Dead Sea? The mountains. The mountains outside Israel where they fled and where they just returned from. And now God's going to use it to bury their enemies. But now it's going to be a big valley called the Valley of the Travelers. That's the literal translation. It will block the way of those who travel there, and they will change the name of the valley to the Valley of Gog's Hordes, or Haman Gog. It will take seven months for the people... Here's the seven again. It will take seven months for the people of Israel to bury the bodies and cleanse the land. Yeah. Again, that's direct from, you know, the books of Moses. Everyone in Israel will help. For it will be a glorious victory for Israel when I demonstrate my glory on that day, says the Sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. After seven months, teams of men will be appointed to search the lands for skeletons to bury, so the land will be made clean. Again, wherever bones are found, a marker will be set up, so the burial crews will take them to be buried in the Valley of Gog's Hordes. There will be a town there called Hamona which means horde, right? Haman Gog. And so the land will finally be cleansed. And now, son of man, this is what the sovereign Lord says, call all the birds and wild animals. Say to them, gather together. For Now, this is Revelation 19. Gather together for my great sacrificial feast. Come from far and near to the mountains of Israel and there eat flesh and drink blood. Eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of princes as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all fattened animals from Bashan. Gorge as if they were the animals, okay? It's saying human blood. Gorge yourself with flesh until you are glutted. Drink blood until you are drunk. This is the, not to people, right? We know God would never do that. This is in the animals because there's a lot of bodies laying around that Jesus just took care of the enemies. Um, This is the sacrificial feast I have prepared for you. Feast at my banquet table. Feast on horses and charioteers, mighty men, and all kinds of valiant warriors, says the Sovereign Lord. My banquet table, the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is it. It's, boy, is it gross. It's a lot different than I thought it would be. Well, Again, this is the word of the Lord, right? Feast at my banquet table. There's no way any of this can be before the seven years. There can be no way. um, It can be any other time except the Battle of Armageddon because this is what we read of. All these these, um, factors, all these aspects of Ezekiel 38, 39, and the outcome of that battle is when the Lord returns. In this way, I will, in this way, to show them this great supper and this great victory that I won for Israel, I will demonstrate my glory to the Gentiles, to the nations. Everyone will see the punishment that I have inflicted on them, 
and the power of my fist when I strike. How in the world, I'm sorry, again, how in the world can this be before the return of Jesus? This is the wrath of God. Punishment? My fist when I strike? This is not some random thunderstorm. And from that time on, the people of Israel will know that I, Jesus, am the Lord, their God. The nations will know then why Israel was sent away to exile. Not only the most recent time, but all the times. It was punishment for sin. For they were they were unfaithful to their God. The whole plan of the Bible is revealed to the world. A whole true history of God's word will be revealed to everyone. Jew and Gentile. Hopefully you're already saved at this point. Then you have your new body and you're not subject to these things that might be uncomfortable. Uh, But we'll still be on the scene. We'll still be on the earth. Uh, Therefore, I turned away from them and let their enemies destroy them. I turned my face away and punished them because of their defilement and their sins. And to finish the narrative here. So now, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will end the captivity of my people. I will have mercy on all Israel. All Israel shall be saved in that day. That's what Paul would say, and he did say that. On what day? The day of the Lord! After he returns, after the nation accepts him, after Israel accepts him as the Messiah, after he defeats their enemies, after he is sitting in the land of Israel as the king on the Temple Mount, then I'll have mercy on them, all Israel, for I jealously guard my holy reputation. They will accept responsibility for their past shame and unfaithfulness after they come home to live in peace in their own land with no one to bother them. When I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, remember a lot of them went into captivity. Look at Joel and Zechariah. They're taken away to again into exile once the invasion happens, those who aren't killed. <clears throat> when I bring them home from the lands of their enemies, I will display my holiness among them for all the nations to see. Then my people will know that I am the Lord, their God, I, Jesus, the Messiah, because I sent them away to exile and brought them home again. I will leave none of my people behind, and I will never again turn my face from them, for I will pour out my Spirit upon the people of Israel, all flesh I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. If you don't, I guess we'll turn here, because if you don't believe that this could possibly be Armageddon still, let's read Revelation 19. I saw heaven opened, verse 11, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages righteous war. His eyes were like the flames of fire, and on his head many crowns. A name was written on him that no one could understand except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations the nations who attacked Israel. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God. Jesus, returning on the white horse, releases the wrath of God. There is no scenario where Jesus returns, takes us to heaven, and then the wrath of God happens when he's off the scene. It's not possible. It's not biblical. It doesn't make sense. 
There's no purpose. God has purpose in everything, friend. So know that when he splits the sky and returns on that white horse and judges the nations and makes righteous war, that is the wrath of God. And we are gathered to him at that point and not before. And there is no going to heaven for those who survive the tribulation. Why do I say that? Because we're instantly given our resurrection bodies and we rule on the earth. We have work to do. Heaven's coming here. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. And on his robe, at his thigh, was written this title, King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures high in the sky, the birds of the air that we just read about in Ezekiel, come gather together for the great banquet God has prepared. We just read that too. Come and eat the flesh, just read that, of kings, generals, strong warriors. King, general, warrior, these are armies who invaded Israel. Of horses and their riders, read that. And of all humanity, both free and slave, small and great. And we know details from Revelation that this includes those who worshipped the beast, took the mark of the beast, and have no hope of salvation. They will be struck down on this day as well, if they're anywhere near it. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the world and their armies gathering together to fight against the one sitting on the horse and his army. The beast, we know where that is. It's the Middle East. It's the leopard, bear, and lion nations together as one. Again, we just read about that in Ezekiel 38. Right? Iran, uh, Sudan, Libya, Syria, Iraq, Tur Turkey, right? This is the beast. And all the armies that are with him. Gathered together to fight the one sitting on the horse that is our so They're like, uh oh, we gotta we're gonna defeat King Jesus. We don't like that he's coming to fight us and take over. We're gonna fight him. And the doesn't say much about that fight other than they lost. And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and worshipped his statue, both or his image. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Their entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding the white horse. And all the vultures gorged themselves on the dead bodies. The end. That is scripture alone. That's the word of God interpreting the word of God. Ezekiel 38, 39, the, the defeat, the invasion, the battle of Gog and Magog, etc., whatever you want to call it, must be Armageddon. It cannot be any other time. And there's reasons why. And we saw them all, okay? There's the bottom line of that. All right, praise God. Uh, let's go to questions, um, if we have any. I think there are, so let me take a gander. By the way, this is the Unsealed radio program. Uh, please support us at unsealedpodcast.com. Share that and donate right there on that page. I'm sure would appreciate that. All right, here we go. Um, YouTube and Facebook. What do we got? I'm going back to the beginning here, so if you asked one recently, hang on a sec. Uh, Miranda's late, no problem. Um... By the way, if you make statements, like, just make a statement that's really not a question, or, like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with that, so I'm kind of skipping over people who are just issuing statements. Um, Gog is a king, Magog's land is Turkey. That's correct. Um, Tarshish might mean Tarsus? No. Um, no. They're, they're different words. The Saul of Tarsus obviously is, uh, you know, modern day Turkey Syria border lands, uh, but Tarshish is different. That's probably Spain, in my opinion. 
Um, and there's a great woman of God. Uh, anti-Semitism will not be... This is Tyrannosaurus, one of my favorite people. Anti-Semitism will not be tolerated by people who know Jesus. By their fruits you'll know them. Wowzers. That's a call to action. Will not be tolerated. How are you going to... That's a great question. My dinosaur friend. Uh, what is, What is not tolerating look like? What does Jesus expect? When he not doesn't tolerate something, what did he do? He did something about it, right? Um... I'm busy deleting things like people who say they met angels and stuff like that. We can't. It's not going to happen here. Um, Erdogan. Uh, this is no World War Three. I think it means no WW3. I don't know who this person's name is. Please tell me your name, if you would. Erdogan is in trouble at home. No, he's not. And he's gathering people against Jerusalem. Uh, he also wants to conquer Assad. I know Turkish Erdogan could be God. Again, he creates some, he checks off some of the boxes, like his location, certainly, like his rage. Yes, he wants to control the, the, the region. Yes, he wants the Ottoman Empire. He wants, the, he wants to be the caliph. No doubt. But that's not enough. That's not all the boxes, okay? There's a process that has to play out. He might well be, if he's anything in the Bible, if he's a character of the end times, um, he might well be the great horn of the goat that has to fight off the Iranian threat and defeat them, and then unify the region, but then he's killed or imprisoned, uh, if you read uh, Daniel 8. So he's not the Antichrist, Gog. Um, let's see... Got a couple amens and yeses. That's good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, uh, AC, Antichrist is going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem? Question mark. Yes. Gog is the Antichrist? Yes. Yeah, I think we just showed that. Ezekiel 38, 12, was it? I mean, God said it. At a certain point, you're just going to have to agree with God, right? Uh, Hermione, Hermione? No way that Antichrist to sit down. Satan is temporary only and will be destroyed. Okay, I'm not sure what you're asking or stating there. It's kind of a statement. Uh, Antichrist will absolutely sit in the temple of God, claiming to be God. We know that. That's scriptural. It's going to happen. And Satan, of course, will be destroyed. Um, at the end of the thousand years, but not until then. So he's going to be here now. He's going to be here throughout the tribulation. In fact, he plays a major role in the the final seven years, in the final three and a half years, certainly. Uh, he's a major player, uh, but then he's bound in prison and can't influence or deceive anyone in the universe for a thousand years in a row. And then only after that imprisonment is over will he be released for a very short time, then destroyed, yes, or thrown to the lake of fire, however you understand that um, thing to be. Um, and of course, the one who is the Antichrist will be killed at the return of Jesus, no doubt. Gog and... It's like I just... It's like I wasted a whole hour uh, when I get comments like this. Gog and Magog War can be before Armageddon. See Douglas Woodward's books? No, thank you. I don't need to see anyone's books. I need to see the Bible. I just, it's, I hate to say it's clear or it's plain because that's really a, a cruddy thing to say and it's kind of a cheap you know, way out, but I, we just read it. We, you, you just saw it. You don't have to rely on me or anybody, good old Doug, or anyone else's opinion. Um, Hermione, were you, did you miss the whole thing? L closely listen and read the prophecy against Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39? Yeah, we just did. 
Uh, yes, Yeshua is our hope and salvation. Amen. Glory to God. A lot of amens. I like this. Um, Ter- I'm getting there, guys. Hold on. I'm almost caught up. Taryn, yes, we're not going before his return because we got work to do. That's right. Work for the children of Israel and Jacob's trouble. Bing, ding, ding, ding. That's right. You win the chicken dinner. Um, thank you, Hermione. Um, my question is, is not really Russia. It's really not Russia. It's really not. <laughs> it's not. Doesn't mean Russia is good. It doesn't mean Russia loves the Jews. It doesn't mean anything other than they're not in the Bible. Neither is America. Neither is Europe, really. Maybe Southern Europe, if you want to talk about, you know, Greece or Tarshish. But, um, you know, South, Southern Africa, Australia, Japan, none of them are in the Bible. Then that's okay. He's the, Russia is certainly not in Ezekiel 38 or 39. No, 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 no. I love Jesus too, Terry. Praise the Lord. Um... Worldliness and faithfulness won't understand. Faithlessness won't understand. What about, hey Tony? What about Revelation? Tw- Revelations. Revelation twenty. We just uh, talked about that. You must have missed it. When the devil is bound for a thousand years, then is loosed for a little while, he deceives the nations who go up against God's people. That's the very, very last time. But that's not till after the millennium. That's a thousand years is already over. That's not on our horizon right now. This is the final rebellion of Satan that is way, way off in our future, okay? Yes, it will happen, but not relevant to this discussion. Uh, It's because people get mad when they hear the truth because... It's the devil and them, and they start spewing out nonsense, thinking they want to go down differently, that it will. I'm sorry, I don't really follow all that. People's opinions don't matter, only what God says. Well, that's true. Uh, Clearly, right? No doubt. All right, guys. We've reached the end of our road here. Uh, Tightly, neatly packaged into uh, about an hour. This has been uh, unsealed, and I invite you to please subscribe to the podcast. This is a podcast, first and foremost, okay? So go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, just type in Unsealed, Christopher Manti, if you'd like. Uh, That'll come up right away. Um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Spreaker, wherever else you could find a podcast. There's a bunch of locations. Go grab it and listen and share, 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 share. Sharing is caring. Comments are nice, but sharing is caring, guys, okay? And giving is really where it's at because it costs money to do this. It does to have the software um, be able to get the message out uh, effectively. It's unfortunately, it does cost a little bit, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And we can sure use your help in that. So go to wings of the slash donate, or just right on the site of unsealed podcast.com. There's a form built right in to donate securely. Um, whatever form you happen to choose, just go ahead and do it there. And we're out of here, all right? I love you all. I thank you for being fellow students of God's Word. And we know His Word is the truth, and Jesus is the truth. And He is the author of the Scriptures, and He is the author and finisher of our faith, of my faith. I'm thankful to Him for this time. Uh, So until next time, Lord willing, we try to do this every Thursday, uh, but until then... This is Pastor Manti uh, saying adieu from Unsealed. And Maranatha. To hear previous episodes, to obtain resources, and to support this ministry, visit unsealedpodcast.com. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most, will grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved.